All right. Hey, it's Marty Leonard's from uh, XRT, and we are backstage at the Aragon Ballroom just hours before Sting hits the stage in the 57th and 9th tour here in Chicago. And uh, the Aragon Ballroom, Sting, it's been a long time since you played here. I think it was 1980, and I haven't got the maths to figure out how many years ago that was. 37, 38? Yeah, it was 37 years ago. I remember being here that night when you played with the police. That was... Uh... Too young to have been there, actually. <laughs> you too. So do I. <laughs> well, it's, it, it is kind of cool that you're here at this, uh, at this venue uh, on the 57th and 9th tour, which is essentially sort of a club tour. Well, we we're playing much smaller places than we normally do. Just because we're introducing so much new music, it's easier to do in a more intimate setting than a... A sports arena, you yeah, know, yeah. people just want to hear hits in a sports arena. In this kind of environment, I can explain what the songs are about. I can talk about them a little bit, but that's not to say we're only doing that. We're also doing lots of hits. So, but I, I, I think people like being crammed into an intimate space for some reason. It feels more communal. <laughs> so I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Well, it's been uh, quite a week for you. Uh, it was only a few days ago. I was at home on a Sunday night watching you perform uh, Empty Chair on the Oscars. What was uh, your Oscar experience like? Well, it's the fourth time I've been nominated, um, so I, I, I know what it's about. Uh, but I was very honored to be uh, nominated because the song is a, is a very important one to me. It was a song about James Foley, if I can remind you who James was. He, he was the young American photojournalist who was beheaded by ISIS in 2014 in northern Syria and they made a documentary about his life which I saw and then the producers asked me to write a song and I said no I can't write a song for this it's too emotional it's too heavy I, I don't know how to, to do that so they said well think about it so that night I, I went home it was Thanksgiving last year and I sat with Trudy and some of my kids and I thought you know, I wonder how I'd feel if one of my kids was in captivity somewhere or in danger. What would I do? I'd probably have a, a ritual of leaving a place for them at the table or a, an empty chair so maybe one day they'd come and fill it again. And once I thought, had that thought about the empty chair, I thought, oh, that's, that's the metaphor. I can write a song now. But without the metaphor, there was no song. So I wrote it that night, and I sent it to the producers the next day, and they said, wow, this is, this is exactly what the film needs, because at the end of this film, you, you are in a pool. It is so heavy and so emotional. They, you need something to help you get your coat back on. So uh, we were up against you know, big studio movies, big hit movies, and it was our little documentary, so I was very proud we were there, and uh, it was just me and a guitar. And then the big drama of the night, of course, was the, was the, was the wrong envelope, which the empty chair and the wrong envelope. Uh, how, did that, uh, how did that play in the room, like, when, when, when that happened? Like, what, what was it like for everyone who was in the audience? Because we, did, we didn't really see that. Well, everyone was in, in kind of shock. But what was lovely was the, was the grace with, with which both teams, the one that had been handed the Oscar by mistake and the ones who accepted it, were so graceful about it, you know, and, so, and, and, and gracious. And that was very heartwarming, that a mistake was made, and then they coped with it in a very human and uh, graceful way. And uh, so I thought it was, it was nice that it happened, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it shouldn't have happened. I think the, the, the firm who were responsible were responsible, but uh, that was nice. Well, it's interesting you said that it was a very human moment because your performance of Empty Chair was really different than the other performances of the songs. Those were big, huge show tune, big, huge production numbers. And uh, it was on, on the Stark stage, and the emotion of that song really, really came through, as did the quote that was put up uh, above you uh, after the song was performed. Well, it was a quote of Jim's about the, the importance of journalism and the moral courage to, to tell the truth. At a time when uh, news media is under attack, when the truth itself is under attack. So Jim Foley is a real um, avatar of courage for me, American, real American courage, to put his life on the line to tell the truth. And he, he lost his life doing that. So he, he demands, in my opinion, demands gratitude and respect from everyone in this country. Uh, because he gave the ultimate sacrifice to tell the truth. Um, there's another performance I'd like to talk to you about, uh, and that was the performance at the Bataclan Theater in uh, Paris. Uh, you performed the first show in that theater 
after it reopened from the uh, terrorist attacks from the year before. What was that night like? Well, again, not not an easy gig. Um, I played there in 1979 with the police, so I had some history there. And um, when they asked me, I didn't really think about it too hard. I just said, I will do it, because I think it's important. But I had to balance two opposite things. First of all, to honor the dead, uh, and honor the, the survivors, some of whom were there, some of the relatives of, of the victims were there. Uh, on the other hand, to celebrate and reopen this historic venue, you know, rather like it's rather like this one here, the Aragon. It's very famous, and uh, it needs to be open. It needs to be, you know, have music and joy and life put back. So I had to balance both things. So I started with a, I started by explaining my dilemma first of all, in very good French. I'll have you know, <laughs> and then uh, we had uh, a minute of silence, which was quite profound. And then I began with a song I normally end with, which is Fragile, because it seemed appropriate. And then after that, people started to relax a little more, and it became a gig, and people started to have fun and celebrate. But it, it needed to go through those stages in order for it to, to be the right thing. And it was, it was a tough gig, though. 57th and 9th, your uh, latest album. Uh, I call it Wacker Drive and uh, Lakeshore, but... Actually, you could call it Lawrence and Broadway because you've played on this corner so many times. Like here, you've played at the Riviera. If you were to come back and do a jazz show at the Green Mill, you would have the Uptown Triangle. You'd, you'd have it. <laughs> the Uptown, it's not the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, right. But uh, the album 57th and 9th, really, uh, really a nice record. Uh, it's always talked about as uh, a return to rock for you. Uh, is that what you had in mind when you started re recording it and writing the songs? You know, I, I never feel I've ever left rock and roll. I mean, I, I play rock every night of my working life. But, you know, I, I suppose for the past 10 years I've been making more esoteric records than, than uh, rock, straight ahead rock and roll. So, yes, it, it is a return to rock. Uh, although there's some esoteric stuff on here too, you know. But I think the main thrust of it is very is, is direct. So yeah. Well, I th I think I heard you uh, talk about the record. It might have, or maybe I read it. But you you said that uh, you treated this uh, like there was a deadline, like you like you were under the gun to to record this record. Well, normally it's pretty open ended. You know, uh, when I start an album and when I finish it, I just wait for the muse and. Um, I, I began the record with a confession to my colleagues. I said, guys, I haven't got a clue what we're going to do with the studio time. I really don't know. And normally I'm very well prepared. Uh, I said, okay, well, let's just play. And we'll just play musical ping pong. And we, we know each other for 10 years and we trust each other. And so the music kind of materialized between us. And then I'd structure it into a song form and then I'd have to figure out what the song was telling me, what the music was telling me. Is there a narrative there? What, what's the mood? What's the story? And, but I did say it has to be finished by a certain date, and we finished it within three months, from soup to nuts. Uh, and so it has an energy that perhaps an open-ended you know, experiment wouldn't have had. So it was a, it was a, a trick, a way of tricking us, tricking the creative flow. Well, in, in the uh, the tour, and the shows that you're doing, you're doing a combination of songs from this album, police songs, songs from your other albums. You have so many songs to choose from. How do you put together a, a set list? Well, I'm doing a lot of this album, uh, 57th and 9th, maybe eight of the ten songs. And then I'll give people what they want to hear, you know. It would be hard for me to, to come away from a show and not sing Roxanne. I think people will be disappointed or every breath you take. Or Englishman in New York, you know. That, so it's the show is laced with uh, classic songs, uh, but the, you know, I'm, I'm also you know spoon feeding them new stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, the band you have, uh, it's it's a combination of your touring band and also uh, the opening acts. You've got the uh, <laughs> Las Bandoleros playing with you and your son Joe. Well, I think the the old idea of a support act and the main act, I think that's that's gone. I, I think people want to see a show, an integrated show. So I open the show on my own with a guitar. Then my son comes out and he sings three songs. Uh, he's joined by the Bandoleros, and then they, they do a, a set of five songs, and me and my band join them on the last of their 
set and and then we have a little break and then it's me with my band and the bandoleros that do the backing vocals with my son Joe so it's an integrated show it's one thing and I, I think people like the energy of that there are two sets of father sons as me and Joe and then Dominic's sons playing second guitar the bandolero is their two brothers uh, so it's a very familial and familiar feeling up there well we're really looking forward to the show and I just want to say to you it's uh, it's great sitting down and talking with you before the show. Um, having played your records on uh, on XRT from the Police through the solo records to the current record for all these years and the thirty some years that I've been working there. Um, wow! Thanks.